there's a lot to be cautious about with, you know, this Canada Canadians are nice idea, right? I think we have a lot of evidence to say, you know, we need to take a second look at that. Don't be too smug. We've, we've got a lot of our own um, attitudes we need to worry about. But what I think is really important is how that translates into the political sphere, right? And so they only become political divisions to the extent that the parties actually capitalize on those cleavages and and, um, and you know really campaign that way. And, and that's not a guarantee that they're going to, right? A, a level of civility in politics, I mean, we have to be fair that our politics up here seems far more polarized than any other time in my life. Um, and yet it's not nearly so polarized as it could be. Most people's conception of democracy um, <clears throat> starts, uh, at least originates, um, back in the days of, of narratives like the Fathers of Confederation, or in the U.S., the Founding Father narrative. It's a, it's a vision that's necessarily, I think, romantic. Um, it's a vision that's about how people are civically engaged all the time, and then, you know, when elections come, they vote for the thing that makes their hearts well, um, really moves them. Um, is, is that what happens at all? <laughs> Well, I definitely think that people vote for what they're passionate about, um, but the views of the founders, the views of uh, any people who put together institutions tend to be a little more practical, right? Like they're they're trying to think of the ideal worlds, and certainly this comes out actually more in the U.S., like the Federalist Papers and, and things that were written at the founding then. So if, you've, if you've, any of you paid attention to Hamilton, the musical, there's a lot of that in there. My kids are finally learning it. There's this um, great sense anyways of trying to keep the country together and fight for your vision of a country, but when it comes down to it, it's once you take that, then it's about who's going to win. Right, and once it's about who's going to win, then it's about how do you appeal to people, and then it's about hmm, what do I like today? So it's a little more cutthroat, I think, than you know, sunshine and. That's deeply depressing. Thank you for that <laughs> opening note. Um, and and Dave, your research in general, to me anyway, I find it so depressing, and I try as much as possible not to think about it. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to just lead with that, right? Welcome, Dave, to the stage. I don't like your research. Um, <laughs> but, but one of the questions that you look into is that, you know, ordinary citizens um, make, just make, can ordinary decisions, ordinary citizens make rational decisions. Um, and what have you found? <laughs> Imagine what it's like to uh, be me. <laughs> I would not. You know, it's... Yeah. Every day you wake up. <laughs> so I think citizens can make, uh, under the right conditions, can make very good political decisions. And, and that, I mean, uh, rational and autonomous. So they can collect information about the world. They can consider it. Uh, they can make a decision. And they can tell you why they made that decision. And if you're really lucky, that why will be an accurate account of the real reasons behind their, their motivations rather than the thing that they're going to tell you. Now, the caveat is the circumstances, the conditions have to be right. And the way that we do democracy, I think, is, uh, is very much, uh, you know, counter to that, those sorts of conditions. So it's too fast, there's too much information, we never get to practice, it's inherently a competition, which means that sides are more interested in mobilizing and demobilizing uh, and, and you know, manipulating rather than persuading than actually trying to deliberate with people to decide, okay, well, what's the best thing that we should do? And that, that's worked for us to a certain degree for a long time. But when it starts to break down, when, when parties, for instance, or third parties start to say, well, we'll do anything it takes to win within the boundaries, or we're going to start pushing some norms, and we, we want, well, we're going to use bots, or we're going to use, we're going to collect your information, uh, you know, sign up, wish Justin Trudeau a happy birthday, sign up here, and then now you belong to the Liberal Party, you know. Right. At least your email does, um, and your children. And, <laughs> and it's high stakes. You know that 
that, those are conditions under which it's very difficult for people to make what I would call a good political decision. Right. And, you know, it's not like, we think of democracy as a good thing, and it, it is a good thing. And it's a good way to keep people, governments responsive, and it's a good way to, to change, you know, the old saying that um, uh, diapers and politicians need to be changed regularly and for the same reason. Uh, is to, I'll wait for it. Eh? <laughs> for, just gauging the, the degree to which the room is comfortable with potty humor. Yeah, yeah. Um, Not very. Yeah, that's that. fine. Yeah. All right, this is a little highbrow. This stuff yeah. in, kills in Vancouver. This is a word on this. <laughs> Take that, Vancouver, and, first uh, of all. Anyway. But, you know, um, but, so ultimately parties don't have an interest in the, in the current system in, in that, though. They want to mobilize. They want to win. And so the challenge is, okay, well, to some extent, the incentives are, are counter to the ideal narrative of the good political decision maker, of the person who's engaged in democracy day to day. So uh, if you are mildly engaged in democracy um, and in politics in general, then you might think, how do I put this, that democracy is something that happens, it's like the World Cup, like it happens every four years. For everyone else who thinks about democracy way too much, like Dave, um, there, are, there are vital signs of what a healthy democracy is. Um, what might those vital signs be? Health of a democracy? Yeah. Yeah, that's a tricky one, right? Because the usual one that people would po point to is how many people turn out to vote. And right. that's an interesting metric. I don't really think it's necessarily the right metric. There's lots of reasons for that. Mostly we care about people who are interested in politics, right? That's what we want. So, you know, you might want to wish Justin Trudeau happy birthday. But it's it really interesting that actually getting those connections and those pieces of material from the party can actually be really important for engaging people in other times. So, you know, the, the partisan component of it is one thing, but we do know that the people who turn out to the vote are the ones who've actually had contacts with somebody. Right. And so, you know, it doesn't always have to be voting, right? I think that's something that's really important to remember. But at the same time, when, you, when we look at who does what, it, we used to think that there were these this whole group of people who weren't voting, but they were doing all this other stuff, and it was great. And the evidence actually doesn't show that, which is somewhat sad or depressing, but it does mean that that mobilization, I think, I think of voting like a gateway drug, like it's the first thing that you start, and then right. once you get that done, you know, you might take on these other elements, and it seems to be true, even though there's lots of reasons to think that you could do other stuff, like you could be involved in, you know, um, city uh, committees, or you could get involved in your parent councils, or you could do lots of things that are very political and very engaged, um, and, and they're not voting, but it, that's not really what happens. It's an interesting truth, right? So it's, it is a good idea to think, how can we more constantly be involved in politics and how can we be thinking about that? But the fact of the matter is it's a very small group of people, right? So I'm from London, Ontario, and they've been, you know, some of our councillors will get together and they say, we have a budget of this, so put forward your ideas for new projects and you can all vote. But how many people actually go and do that? Right? I mean, that, and then it turns into something like, you know, we need a new bench here or we need a new park thing here or something. Like, they're, they're actually concrete items. But how many people are getting involved? And I mean, that's an open activity. So, I mean, it's, a, it's a, I think, a catch-22 because on the one hand, you need these processes available. You want them. And I think actually politicians fairly do want to hear what's being said, but the difficulty is the messages aren't clear, the signals aren't clear, right? If you think about what Justin Trudeau did about electoral reform and how much flack he got for his national right. survey, right? But there was no way that survey was going to produce a clear message about what the government should do. Why is that? Because it's, it's so confusing and complex of an issue, and the way it was designed has some other issues, but when you're trying to figure out what's a clear signal, it's, it's really hard to figure it out. But you know what? It's, it's, it's that confusion that makes people want to be more disengaged, right? Because sure. when, you, when you perceive that confusion, like, for example, um, Ontario politics in general, but also specifically Toronto politics, like, I don't know how many of you know whether we have a 47 ward system or a 25 <laughs> ward system. I'm not sure either. Um, 
I am is tw it's 20. It's, anyway, we're, we're, that's a whole other conversation. But um, the perception of the, of the, the ways um, that these systems um, operate is that like you feel like you're entirely outside of it. You feel like yeah. you're entirely outside of the decision-making process, um, that it's mostly people who look like Dave but 40 years older um, who have these conversations. Like, be so lucky. <laughs> All right, but that that yeah. make these decisions, funny guy, huh? Um, <laughs> that that makes these decisions, but they're so removed from their daily realities that it's just hard to know where to start engaging. Well, problem. So you know, hands up if you have the time and energy to regularly engage deeply in participatory politics. Yeah. Right. I mean, so we. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's my job, yeah. so I have time to do it, and yeah. I find it exhausting and difficult. And part of it is a resource problem, and that's why we have a representative democracy. So we've got to find a way to balance the importance of, of representatives who are responsive to the public, and that means that they have to know what the public wants. Incidentally, there's not a ton of data on that in Canada, but the, the stuff that I've seen suggests that Canada's more responsive than the U.S., for instance. Um, there's a paper, a famous paper now um, from uh, Gillens and Page uh, in the US. They made it to The Daily Show. There's some pushback on the paper, but they've defended it. But their conclusion was effectively that the US was a functional oligarchy. You know, if you look at policy from 1970 to 2000, it's wealthy people and special interests get what they want and the people don't. That was their conclusion. We don't have quite the same study I've never seen in Canada, but it seems that ours is, is better. Uh, but, you know, my vision of a more robust democracy is representative, but you have these participatory things built in. The radical bit is I also want the redistribution of resources to make sure that it's possible for people to participate. Uh, so far, as, and this is a paper I've been working on for a while, but I, I would love to see citizen juries built into the democratic system here that involve compensation. Things like guaranteed time off work, money, so childcare, so on down the line. And we could do that. And He's we, not running for office. Guys. And we could He's do not. that. If you elect me, I will never leave. <laughs> You'll only have to do it once. It'll be very efficient. <laughs> but Good. so, so democracy. Here's, so here's the challenge. That one of the biggest challenges of democracy, and this is talked about in a, in a great book called Against Elections. And it says, you know, democracy is a trade-off, constant trade-off between efficiency and legitimacy. And you've got to get the balance right. So you can have a wildly efficient model with one person at the top as an autocrat, but then you run into a legitimacy problem. And you can have a lot of legitimacy by consulting endlessly on everything, but never get anything done. And so the wisdom is finding the balance. So I think we, we could find a balance in representation with these participatory things that are built in. And there's a model for that, which is a deliberative democracy. Now, it doesn't cure all problems, and you got to get the deliberations right. There's a great book by uh, uh, scholar Tally Mendelberg and Chris Karpowitz, and they say, they called uh, The Silent Sex, and they, they looked at gender and deliberation, and sort of they came up with a, almost a golden ratio of how many women you need in the room to offset men <laughs> when the men are misbehaving, which mm. is What's the number? Always. Well, so I don't remember the exact ratio, but it, so it's got to be more than one to one, but you, you can't have too many. Really? because then you get peacocking. So in legislatures, it's about 30% is the magic number, they say, for women's issues to be more prominent in, uh, in what gets done. And we're not quite at 30%. We're not at 30 no. no. Which is, but this is what I mean. It's like we need to think about the fine-tuning of the balance in, in this, even in deliberations. But the idea behind deliberative democracy is, is what we have is, is aggregative democracy. You know, everyone battles it out, and then you just count the votes. Uh, and whoever wins, wins. In a, in a more deliberative system, you sit down and you exchange reasons with one another. It doesn't mean you have to have that consensus. That sounds crazy. It doesn't mean, all. well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but this is it. Time consuming. It, it and it's time consuming and it's expensive, which is why we shouldn't do it all the time. But, you know, the, the model of, say, a, a Supreme Court is a deliberative model. It's not democratic, but it's deliberative. Um, you could have these deliberative assemblies, like the BC Citizens Assembly or the Ontario Assembly, as, as semi regular features of our democracy that would allow people to, to take part. Okay. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> well, that was, I mean, do you guys remember the 2007 referendum in Ontario? Because <laughs> there were a lot of people who went to the polls and didn't know there was another ballot that they had to deal with, right? Because there was an election at the same time. It's a, I, th I agree that deliberation is a great way to come up with a compromise um, and to come up with a system that people really thought through. Um, but that's a pretty tall order. 
Um, and I think that when we're talking about how to govern, I mean, to be fair, we are in a representative democracy and that speed of having people to make decisions that we've chosen is you know, kind of required in order to, for us to handle the stuff that's going on. I just, just imagine right now that the NAFTA talks that are going on were subject to deliberation on what Canada should do, right? It, that wouldn't work. It's just not functional. Um, but we have this great opportunity to kick people out, right? So, I mean, that works really well. I think we saw that recently in Ontario, right? If you want to get rid of somebody or a party, you can do that whole hog. And, it, you know, it's, it's a messy instrument, but it's it's something to be aware of, you know, who's going to be involved and when. And to be fair, who's going to take part in a lot of these citizen processes? Who's going to be there? Who's going to have that time? I mean, you can definitely offer childcare and, you know, pay and you can do that. And certainly the citizens' assemblies are great models of that because they, they aim to be quite representative of the provinces. But um, when you think about who's going to even put their name forward to be engaged, kind of runs into a different situation, right? It's the most interested persons. And then you're getting a different group altogether. So maybe the most interested people aren't actually speaking for everyone. And this is something to be aware of, right? So this is why if, if you only read one newspaper or, you know, you have your favorite television show or even on social media and you've got all the people that you follow and what they do, you tend to have one view of what's going on and then when the vote happens, you're like, how'd that happen? What the heck, right? But that's because there's all these others who we're paying attention to in a democracy. Right. It sounds like you both are saying we're not very good at democracy. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Have we ever been? Well, it depends what you mean by being good at democracy. I mean, have, have we ever had uh, a Canada where participation in democratic processes was higher and you would describe as more optimistic than right now. <laughs> yeah, we certainly have. I mean, I, when I first started studying this stuff, Canada's uh, participation rate was about 75%. And this is what I knew, and I studied in the U.S., so I felt very superior because they had lower turnout rate. Um, and then Obama came along and switched things around, and then that didn't look so good. Um, so, yeah, we have had more turnout in the past, but this has a lot to do, I mean, the studies would say it has a lot to do with how engaged people feel or how dutiful they feel about going out to the polls. I mean, this is something that's been found time and time again, right? That if you don't feel this duty to vote or this civic um, benefit that you get, this intangible benefit from voting, you don't go out to the polls. And unfortunately, if you look at the graphs, they're kind of crazy. It's the young people who are now becoming older people um, who are kind of lacking some of these feelings. But I mean, none of that has anything to do with being a well-informed citizen going to the polls, right? And there's a great set of arguments out there that say, we all know enough to make an informed vote just based on our daily lives. So for example, you like what's going on right now with Justin Trudeau as prime minister, you're doing okay with your job, your family's doing okay, you're, you're happy with the state of things, you give them another chance. You don't like what's going on, you vote for someone else, right? It's a very basic punish reward model. Right. That's kind of the system we have. Dave, you shook your head fervently. You're like, no, we're not. We've oh, no, no, no. I no, I, I agree. Um, I think part of the problem is we have it just, many of us have it just good enough that we're not encouraged to turn out. But lots of people don't have it so good. Right. And what about them? And so that's one of my concerns. But so, I, you know, when Iraq and Afghanistan started holding elections, there were threats of violence. People were killed, people were dismembered. Um, because of the way the systems work, they would mark your thumb and ink when you voted, that's how you know who voted. Uh, and the you know, terrorist organizations would track down those who had ink on their thumbs and would exact retribution for taking part in this, this democratic system there. And turnout was, at the time at least, through the roof. The stakes of voting, the risks to your person and to your family for, were literally life and limb and people were turning out, in the, I think, in the 90s. Now, I think that's tapered off a little bit as you'd expect, but it was quite high and you could literally be killed for it. In Canada, the cost of voting is you got to pop out of work for a couple hours. For most people, some people it's trickier, shift work and so on. But you got to pop out down the street and maybe stand in the line for 20 or 30 minutes and, and you know, turnout's quite low, and especially among young people. So, I mean, as Laura says, it's it's... Young people, if you look at turnout on aggregate and you say, okay, well, 68% of people turn out, that's whatever. If you break that down by age bracket, 
say 45, I can't remember what it is, 45 or 50 and above or something like that, and then 30 something, 34 and, and younger, it looks like two different planets. The spread is, I can't remember, something like 40 points or, or maybe yeah. even more. But it was way better in 2015. But it was way better in way 2015 because people got excited about Justin Trudeau. Yeah. So, but that's a tough, you know, we can't rely on people getting exciting, uh, excited about Trudeau. And I bet those, it'll go back down again, or at the very least, it'll be stagnant in 2019 as people start to get a little bit more, or, you know, cynical, a little bit more frustrated with, with the liberals and, and perhaps not as excited as you might think they would be about the NDP. So that's a tough model to, to run on. And it also incentivizes politicians to play to the crowd in ways that might not be substantive. So, uh, you know, it, I, I worry that we'll be taking things for granted right up to the point where we fall off the cliff. And I'll, I'll finish that point with, the, which, with this final... I'm worried that I'm, I'm a little self-conscious now about depressing you, because I feel... <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> that ship is... <laughs> And so, long sale. <laughs> you know, imagine things right now around the world, liberal democracy, you know, is, we're in what's known as a democratic retrenchment or, or democratic recession. So there's huge gains in the number of democracies in the world after the fall, of the, at first when during the decolonial period, and then after the fall of the Soviet Union. Now that's tapered off and is starting to actually slow down. Uh, I'm worried that when the worst of, of climate change catches up with us, uh, and we start to see things like resource uh, droughts, uh, extreme weather, refugee crises. We're not going to have a robust enough democratic um, institutions to protect what we have. And then it will all fall apart, um, you know, quickly wow, and in a very really, nasty way. You really went there. Well, because, yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, look what happened with Syria. And, and how nasty that was here and in the United States and in, and in Germany and in France and a little bit in Lebanon and, Tur and, and uh, Jordan. You mean in terms of the refugee crisis? In terms of how we responded. Right. Yeah. Imagine something on the order of magnitude 10 times worse while you're dealing with extreme weather events. So, and what's that going to look like in a democratic society where people aren't more deeply engaged with one another on a regular basis? Are you worried about a politics of division? Yeah. Or, cl or a collapse. And so you think deliberation would help that? Yeah. I'm trying to be uplifting now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I mean, the politics of division is, is a real concern, obviously, and we've seen lots of examples of this, not only certainly in the U.S., we've seen it up here, we've seen it in Quebec, um, certainly. And I think there's, there's a lot to be cautious about with, you know, this Canada, Canadians are nice idea, right? I think we have a lot of evidence to say... You know, we need to take a second look at that. Don't be too smug. We've, we've got a lot of our own um, attitudes we need to worry about. But what I think is really important is how that translates into the political sphere, right? And so they only become political divisions to the extent that the parties actually capitalize on those cleavages and, and, um, and you know, really campaign that way. And, and that's not a guarantee that they're going to, right? A, a level of civility in politics, I mean... We have to be fair that our politics up here seems far more polarized than any other time in my life, um, and yet it's not nearly so polarized as it could be. Um, and it, that's important. I mean, we just did a study trying to look at this, and we thought we'd be seeing all this evidence of this great separating of attitudes amongst party supporters, and we didn't. Like, right, so that's not what we're seeing. So um, I think it's really about the politicians themselves, right? And even if you think about populist appeals, what is it that they're appealing to? Because if there's different ways you can go with those cleavages, and some are very much against values I think that we would hold dear as, as Canadians, and certainly that make up our fabric, and others are our general kind of class arguments, right? Like working class versus right. not. Maxim Bernier is going to be one of the litmus tests, I think, of this. Because, you know, he, he says, look, this isn't a party for racists. This isn't a party for xenophobes. This is a party about cheaper milk and, you know, undoing Trudeau's radical multiculturalism. Then he doesn't specify what that is. Whatever that is, yeah. What, yeah. But then, and then the first story about his party a couple days after it launches is Bernier's party can't keep up with all the racist comments online. <laughs> Right. right. So, I mean, it's put it like, you know, it might be the case that the old line is, is, that's used about Republicans is going to be true of Bernie's party, too. Not everyone in Bernie's party is a racist. But if you're a racist, 
That's your you're probably in Bernie's yes. party, right? And so uh, we saw a little bit of that in 2015 when the conservatives got desperate and went full-blown snitch line. Uh, they paid a price. People weren't ready for that, I don't think. They, they for the most part, reacted by, by shunning him and turning towards Trudeau in sunny ways. But that doesn't always last very long. I mean, if, if things start to get bad and people start to feel it, I mean, keep in mind, this is happening at a time where the economy is pretty good and... But if that starts to turn, I'm worried that, that uh, people start looking at Bernie and say, yeah, okay, because this goes back to the brain thing. Our, I mean, like our brains evolved for you know, the Pleistocene, a period that ran to about 12,000 years ago, give or take, back millions. And it evolved for a very different sort of environment for, for existing than big cities and fast news cycles and... Um, you know, people you've never met that you're supposed to connect with. I mean, Joe Heath in a book, Enlightenment 2.0, makes the point, like, you've got to build the nation every generation because people just forget. It's just too big. It's too far. It's out there. They know their family. They might know their neighborhood. They know their, their sports clubs. But we're sort of wired for close and even chauvinistic attachments. And so if you look at the United States, in a book called Democracy for Realists, um, the authors make the point that like, it is just driven by identity, party identity. People latch on to a party, this is my team, and then their beliefs will follow wherever the party goes. They don't even care. They're just in it to win it. And that's why when you look at someone like Trump and you say, well, how could people possibly? It's like it's an identity thing. And I'm worried that you know, in Canada it's, it hasn't been quite the same, but I'm worried that, that it'll, it'll trend that way if we're not careful. I'm going to... Come back to that in a minute. All of that is depressing. Thank you. Um, but I, so I, I didn't take out my phone randomly in the middle of a panel, by the way. That would be incredibly rude. He's checking his Twitter um, followers. Yeah. As we speak. <laughs> have you followed me yet? No. Um, I, I, I took it out because the other day I saw this deeply troubling meme that was flying around that had like a couple of thousand shares. Nothing too terrifying. Um, but it was this person who was who tweeted, I'm Canadian, maybe we should remember the words of the founding fathers. This, these were the words. And then highlighted were, any man who says that he is a Canadian but tries to impose his customs and his habits upon us is not a Canadian. We have room for only one flag, the Canadian flag. There's room for only two languages here, English and French. Um, that's right. And then it was attributed to Laurier, which it most definitely was not. <laughs> That was a Roosevelt quote. Um, and so... It's, it's probably not the Canadian flag. Def not at all the Canadian flag. <laughs> Roosevelt wasn't talking about the Canadian flag. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, but thousands of people shared it under the understanding that, you know, Wilfrid Laurier at a certain point was like, oh, we have two languages in 1907. What? Anyway, um, the, 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 to me, what's terrifying about this, in, this immediate democratic um, moment um, is that there are so many threats, including technological threats from people whose entire purpose is just to distort information. Are we ready for this, Laura? <laughs> That's a pretty big question. I mean, yeah, the, the technological threats are something that is, uh, you know, we are dealing with, and I think that's actually the next panel, right? So we're talking about Facebook, and, and certainly the, the fake news cycles and the, um, the various other the issues with bots and things like that. Those are, those are really worrisome, mostly because we have to get our information from somewhere, right? And we have a limited amount of time, a limited amount of energy uh, to gather information. And, you know, the idea of, of being very, very partisan and having this identity. I mean, identity is what, as humans, kind of guides us in everything, right? And whether it's it's partisan identity or group identity of some sort, um, I mean, that's, how we, that's just how we are as people. That's not a political thing. Um, it just so happens that every once in a while, those political identities kind of take over and provide these really great heuristics right, or shortcuts yeah. to understand what it is that how we should think right because you, you know you're confronted with an issue and you're looking at it going well I don't know what the answer is but I'm gonna ask my friend who knows a lot right because you trust your friend and you know you think they have similar views to yourself and so you follow their guidance I mean that's the same thing with these identities um, the concern is when they when people are people who aren't trying to be nice um, are, take those identities and put for, forward fake information you right. know when it comes to that because then you're kind of taken in and you know the amount of time it would take to fact check is huge now there are groups that are trying to help us on that but I do think that's a big concern for sure yeah I don't 
I don't know. I, I, put it this way. I don't, when the, the internet was new, it was supposed to be this democratizing, empowering tool that was going to save humanity. <laughs> and then it became a place where we could all watch cat videos. Yeah. And that would have been fine. That might save humanity. Yeah, that would have been great. <laughs> yeah. If the internet had been like, okay, well, I'm going to order, I'm going to, you know, my, my car from Amazon, I'm going to buy my groceries from Amazon, they're going to be here in 15 minutes, and we're going to look at cat videos, and then text my grandmother, that would be great. Yeah. But then it became weaponized, and I... You know, we're still we're collecting the data. We're figuring out now what the what the effect's going to be. I've seen things that say actually it didn't really matter that much here or there. You know, the bots during Brexit weren't as powerful as you might think, or you know that because uh, not everyone uses social media the way that people like we do. So we you know we think that that's where the world happens on Twitter. It's like no, there's like journalists playing inside baseball on Twitter. All the and people, time. Yeah. 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 It is a bit of a club. Most people aren't doing what we do, but it, it might be going that way. One thing that does worry me is so Facebook, you know, there's some evidence that suggests that when, when people go onto Facebook, they use heuristics or shortcuts to be like, okay, well, it's, well, what's my friend posting? What's my uncle posting? That the power that people who are close to you have when they're posting things is quite strong. And there is new evidence that suggests that op-eds change minds, which uh, made me feel really good for once. I knew I did have a <laughs> good impact after all those years of writing. And, but the, it used to be that there were gatekeepers. There were a few media conglomerates and they were pretty careful about what was out there. And people said, okay, well, that's a bit of a problem though because it's a pretty narrow range of views and that's, we don't really love that idea and so we want to open it up, which is great. You want diversity, you want alternative voices, you want a good representation. But what's happening is the whole thing is collapsing and now it's the Wild West and there's no gatekeepers. And so now Infowars comes up or memes come up and these things can become really powerful and there's just no one to check it until we look to the tech companies and say, well, what are you guys going to do about it? They're working on it, but I don't think they have a clue yet what to do. And I also don't trust them, um, in, in part because they're, they have profit motives, and that's fine, that's how the system works. Um, but they're going to go, they're going to follow what's best for them. And so in, in Germany, for instance, when a German hate speech law was adopted, uh, there was a severe fine for tech company, for Facebook, for instance, uh, if, if there was something that violated the law up for more than, I think, 24 hours. And it was some wild fine, it was like 40 million euros or something like that. So if you're a tech company, what are you going to do? How are you going to react to that? You're just going to take everything down and you're going to do it immediately. And if you're someone who wants to try to game the system, what are you going to do? You're going to try to get the tech companies to take down things that you don't like to game the information system, and that's what started to happen. So right now, we're just flailing around in the middle of the Atlantic. We have no idea what the model is going to be for patching back together this information space. And that's happening at the same time and, and alongside with this decline of, of liberal democracy, the rise of Putin in Russia, the rise of China, uh, growing populism in Europe and, and, and North America, the sort of authoritarianism, and climate change. Right. So, you know, B minus? <laughs> that's, he he that's, is kind of depressing. Yeah, quite. I, I just don't feel good about it. And, and I, I, give me, before we end, I always try to, I have this, this sort of this model I use. I try to end on an uplifting note. So just don't let me forget to do that. <laughs> He's got nothing uplifting. No. Um, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm gonna open up for some questions for you guys, because I'm sure you have lots. Ooh, love the hands going up. Gonna take those hands and bring them over to this microphone over here, though. Um, and that's where you'll be lining up to ask the questions. I'm really excited about this. So anybody who wants to come up, microphone's right over here. Hello. Hello? Okay. Hi. Uh, so. Thank you very much. Um, that was really enlightening. My name is Alice Herma. I'm a graduate student, and I came here today to take notes like a nerd because I'm <laughs> studying technology and politics, and so all this has been really relevant. Um, my question, I guess, is um, we've touched on it a little bit that democracy assumes that citizens are rational people, that they take information and then they make the best decision with the information. But 
you know, recently we're coming to realize that we're extremely irrational, we're very emotional creatures, that's how populism and authoritarianism kind of gain speed. And I'm wondering your thoughts on, is there a way or, or is there a way forward for the democratic process to acknowledge that we're kind of irrational that, and to integrate our emotional lives into a democratic process in a way that's productive as opposed to divisive? Thank you. Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting question. I guess I would, um, but I, the premise of your question is that it, it, the, there's a rational way of voting and an irrational way of voting. And I'm not sure that that's, that's a real dichotomy there. I mean, the, the old models of voting would suggest that you always vote for the party that is going to bring you the, the greatest utility in your life, that has the best policies, right? Um, but that's not really what we do, right? There's the metric of, you know, would you go and have a beer with that person because that's the politician you want. But you, if you think about it, this is an important point. When you're actually choosing a representative, that's a pretty good metric because you're saying, is this someone that I would trust to make a decision on my behalf? So that's partially an emotional response, right, to what's going on there. Um, and I think there's this, there's a, well, I know there's a big literature out there that suggests that, you know, people can get enough information to make a pretty wise choice. Um, and so I think that we should rethink what it means to have a rational vote in a democracy and what goes into what we think. What if we made candidates just like write out their platforms and then never provide their names, you know? And then you just <laughs> yeah. vote for a platform afterwards. Like, is that a way to well, mitigate for emotions? Well, is that crazy? I don't know. The only crazy part is that you don't know what's going to come up when those people govern. That's true. Right? And so I do think that personality and competence and experience actually matters a lot. Like, so, you know, you could have a brand new party. So Bernier could come out with this platform that seems amazing. But if you don't trust him to enact it, then no one's, I'm assuming, not going to support that, right? And the same thing. You could have thought that in 2015, the Liberals had an amazing plan, but Trudeau wasn't ready. And so are you going to vote for someone who's not ready to put forward what he's doing? Like, I mean, right. these are integrally connected, and I don't think we can forget that. I've got a great book for you. <laughs> I've got my laptop open. It is mine. <laughs> it hasn't come out yet. It's out of March. You gotta wait till March. I to March. Oh, no. <laughs> What's your program? Uh, it's, it's in OCAD, so it's the Strategic Foresight Innovation Program. Ooh. You guys should talk. We should talk. Yeah. I'll be around. All right. I'll, I'll, so, I mean, I, I agree. And I think one of the ways you, you insulate your system is by developing different institutions that can check each other, one another. So we're not going to do away with elections, and we shouldn't. We're, we're not going to do with, away with representation, and we shouldn't either. I mean, the idea is people have lives outside of politics. They do, maybe not everyone in this room, but, but most people do. I, I, even I do. What? And I, <laughs> I don't. No, I don't. <laughs> uh, and so that's good, because you want to live your life. But the question is, OK, well, do we, do we have some participatory mechanisms that we can build in society to act as a bit of a check? Do we have a good, reliable court system? Do we have a, you know, a, a legislative chamber that has rules that prevent people from going off the rails? Uh, you know, do we have um, you know, municipal checks, provincial checks, federal checks that can, uh, that can make sure that levels of government aren't, aren't abusing their power? For instance, maybe municipalities should um, have more constitutional authority than they than they. Can. That would be nice. Uh, 1867. We de we designed a constitution for a very different time. If we were to do it again today, it would not look like the current constitution by any stretch of the imagination. I think. Um, but I would say that in terms of introducing rationality, and I would say autonomy as well, because I want someone to not just make a good decision, but be able to tell you why they made it. That's a high bar, that's an ideal, but that's the ideal that guides me. Um, we could do that by having participatory deliberative mechanisms, some of them built in. Now you could do it in the model of, of say, agenda setting, because I agree that you wouldn't want a deliberation around NAFTA. Certainly when you're dealing with other countries and the, the situation is fluid, it's the reason that the government says we don't negotiate in public, and, and they shouldn't negotiate in public. I respect them for that. But in, uh, in Europe, uh, several years ago, they had what was known as the G1000, 
And there was a thousand people, which is to say about 750, uh, who came together and had these series of deliberations over the course of, of a period of time. And they would have smaller groups and, and then they have a plenary and they built an agenda. And this deliberation had an agenda setting effect. So one of the ways you could introduce a more rational politics and a more engaging one is to have this sort of mass deliberation thing across the country that builds up an agenda. And it's a way for, for citizens to signal to their leaders, this is the sort of thing we care about and this is what we, what we want to talk about. That pop. would have been great to have, sorry, I'll, I'll finish real quick. That would have been great to have around 2008 uh, when the Canada Works or Action Plan came out. And we could have said, we really want to put a lot of money into renewables instead of like repaving Highway 1. So uh, we can get ahead of China or in Germany in the production of, of renewable. We want to be a, a renewable leader. And we want to base it in Alberta, for instance. So that we have the future of Alberta that's not bound up in fossil fuels. But we didn't. We just put up signs and paved roads. So... Right. So the, these do seem to be happy days for autocrats, leaders making decisions without consultation. So you got Trump setting tariffs without Congress, Ford's doing his ward thing. Um, did, as, as citizens, did, do we want this to happen because it is an easier model? Democracy is hard, autocracy is easy for us. Well, I don't think we want people to have um, absolute power. And I think a lot of the things that have been happening, I mean, I'm, I'm going to leave Trump aside for now, right? Because we're not talking about U.S. politics. But um, with what's going on in Canada right now or in Ontario, I mean, everything that's happening is with support of a party, right? So Ford's making decisions, but it's actually Ford with his party, and they're standing behind him, and they're supporting him, and he's doing something that's within his powers. And that could be checked if it wasn't. Um, and this is why you know, they only have gone to the courts, and the courts have sided a certain way. There are checks in place, and then we will, of course, have elections coming forward. I mean, I don't think we ever want absolute control, but that's a little bit of an issue to do with party discipline. Um, and that's the way our system is very strong on party discipline, right? That you don't have people standing up and going against their leader. And there's many reasons for that. But if, uh, if we were to reduce that and re relax that a little bit, then you may see a little more checks on leaders. I will say that the one thing um, I always feel pretty good about is that if we did have a party leader that we couldn't handle who happened to be premier or prime minister, I mean, there are mechanisms in place to replace the leader without calling a new election. Our parliament is actually a pretty stable system that doesn't depend on an individual. I mean, they got Trump, right? He's not going anywhere unless he's impeached. Um, and that's how it is with the system there. But we have a different set of systems. The caucus has a lot more power here. Uh, so I think there are checks in place. It's just we get really frustrated. And what ends up happening is we get frustrated because we see things and we don't know what else to do. And what we can do is pressure our own representatives. Um, because our representatives are the people who are supposed to be speaking for us, right? And enough pressure on them, remember, they want to get reelected, uh, is, is where we can go with that. Yeah, I, I agree with Laura, but, but I'll add a little depressing sub-note. <laughs> I'm just going to lean into it. <laughs> I mean, what have I got to lose? Yeah. I, uh, there are some numbers from Pew last year, the year before, uh, they surveyed the world about democracy and they sort of asked, you know, what do you think about democracy, autocracy, military rule, technocracy? Technocracy is ruled by experts. And, uh, most, and then the headline was, you know, democracy is pretty good. But there was a lot of support for, um, a disturbing amount of support for military rule and for autocracy. But for, for technocracy, it was 50-50. People liked the idea, well, the experts will just decide. Never mind the fact that we can't agree on who the experts are, and experts, trust me, are wrong all the time. But the message that I got from doing research for my book was people want results. And to a certain extent, they're willing to trade process for results, at least in the short run. So there's this idea that, okay, well, in the, in the legitimacy versus efficiency balance, we'll trade the legitimacy concerns away if we get efficiency. Of course, the problem is when you start to trade away legitimacy, you get into trouble. Because now you have no way to check so I'm a little bit worried that we're, we're a little too ready to, to trade away some of the, the process which keeps politicians in check to get what we want. The good news is, though, in Canada, I think for Canadian democracy is just among the best democracy in the world. And it's not because we're better. It's because our institutions, for all kinds of historical reasons, are, are just far better. We'll be probably one of the last countries standing. Hey, that's positive. <laughs>
He finally got to it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I have a feeling you're ending now because <laughs> you said you'd end on a positive. So the one thing I find missing in the conversation is the role of social movements. We're talking mm -hmm. about representative democracy, but what about movements such as 15 and Fairness that continue to fight despite Ford being elected? They are on the ground, engaging people at the door, getting them to contact their MPPs. This is citizen power, and I really think it has to be part of the conversation. And I know I can't ask two questions, but now that we have a 25-seat council we're looking at, I think the role of community councils has to be seriously looked at and how to expand those. Really? I, I mean, I think social movements are um, a really important part of the story, and, and historically, uh, those kinds of movements, especially when they would come out of smaller parties, traditionally, when the liberals and the PCs at the time were the only two parties going around, um, you would see that those parties would kind of absorb those issues as they became more and more popular. And I think social movements have a great strength because then the politicians pay attention, and it's a great way of showing um, things that are coming up from the grassroots that people need to pay attention to. So I'm always encouraged to see that kind of activity. I can't quite comment on the community councils because I don't live here <laughs> to experience it as much. But um, I think any time we have, though, citizen engagement with such a large population, then you know we, whatever you can delegate to a level that can speak more for the population that they're serving, I think that has uh, really great benefits. Yeah, so our model of democracy is, I, mean, I agree completely, uh, what, uh, is pluralist. And so the idea is there's a whole bunch of different groups and they sort of battle it out for, to get what they want. And I think the best democracies are ones that have a balanced pluralism and so that no group has too, too much power. So social movements are, are critical in balancing out power. And one of the encouraging things that we're seeing, I think, in, in the United States and in Canada is social movements as a counter check to bad politicians. So, you know, you do, for whatever reason, get a politician you might not like, like Trump or Ford, and then, the, then there's this counter power that rises to push back. And so, uh, you know, I, I would say that is absolutely critical. As a really quick, bigger question, though, to make those social movements work, we need to find ways to make sure there's ample redistribution um, so that we can have lots of participation in them. And, and otherwise, what you get is is uh, the pooling of power. I mean, the, the, uh, if we wanted to turn this all, if we wanted our best shot at turning all of this around, my argument is, is redistribute resources and empower more people to take part uh, because otherwise power pools and that's when you get into trouble. I think uh, that is the last of our questions. So I'd like to thank our panelists today. Thank you so much for participating. This was so great and so depressing. <laughs> I think it, I, depressing in a meaningful way, I think. Like, I think all of us kind of take away some of the tensions of our democracy uh, with us, I think, from here. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's good for you to sort of be a little bit on edge, a little bit for, you know, more aware of, of the pressure points of democracy. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Yeah.